Hey, I'm excited to jump into a new series with you this morning, and uh, we are starting one entitled Footprints, and what we're going to look at throughout this series is, is really what does it look like to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? What does it look like to model our life after the life of Christ? What is it going to look like for us if we are truly following Jesus? What places is that going to lead us to, and, and what areas of life is that going to challenge us And so as we start this series, I want to look at a conversation that Jesus had with some individuals before they actually were disciples of Christ. And it's a conversation that's found in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. And we're going to be in verses 35 through 39. And then I kind of want to break down this dialogue that we're going to look at this morning. And so if you're here today, I would encourage you to take notes um, because I do believe that you will retain so much more as you take notes and you write these things down and God brings them to your remembrance. Remembrance. And so here's how it reads in John chapter 1, starting with verse 35. It says, The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. Now I want you to understand that the John that is being talked about in this passage of scripture is not the, the writer of the gospel of John, but it's actually John the Baptist, the one that came to prepare the way for Jesus. And it says that John is there and he's standing there with two of his disciples. And this is a very important detail because what we have to understand about these two individuals that John is standing there with is that they devoted themselves to being disciples of John the Baptist. And that's a big deal. Because to be a disciple of someone means that you are going to entrust yourself to someone fully. What they're saying to John the Baptist is that, John, we want to be and become like you. And so scripture tells us that one of the two disciples that are standing there is an individual by the name of Andrew, who is the brother of Simon Peter. And theologians believe, we don't know this for sure, but through context and through some of the other things in, that are written in the Gospel of John, many theologians believe that the other individual in this story, the other disciple, is actually John, the one who wrote the Gospel of John. And so it says that he stand there with two of his disciples. And it goes on, and it says, and he looked at Jesus, and he's, as he's standing there, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Now, you have to understand that John the Baptist, at this point, has been building something. I mean, people are following him. They're becoming his disciples. He's proclaiming and preparing the way for Jesus to come. And the Bible says that as Jesus walks by, that John utters these words, Behold the Lamb of God. And the individuals at that moment that were following John the Baptist get up and leave and begin to follow Jesus. And we don't read anywhere in the story where John the Baptist is upset about this, where John the Baptist is angry about this, because John understood that it, this is what his life was all about. It was about pointing people to Jesus. And I want to remind us this morning that this is really the calling upon every single one of our lives, that we live our life in such a way that we are always pointing people back to Jesus. John didn't get upset. John wasn't like, you know what? This is destroying the ministry that I'm trying to build. No, no. John was excited because he understood that his whole mission in life was to point people to Jesus. And I want to remind us as a church today that the true mark of a good ministry, a true mark of a good church is that we will always be a community and a people that is pointing to Jesus. That the best ministries that are around are not ministries that are built on personalities or, or individuals or people in the body of Christ. The best ministries and the best churches are the ones that are simply saying, it's not about me, but it is always about Jesus. And we have to always be a community and a church and a body of believers that's saying, hey, let there be less of me, less of my personality, less of my life be exalted, and let it all be about the name of Jesus. That's what it's all about, church. It's what it's all about. And so it says, 
that they, they turned and they followed him. And they would go on and, and said to them, they asked them this question. Jesus looks at these individuals and, and they turn and they follow after Jesus. And what's interesting in this story is this is the way that I kind of picture it. They see Jesus. He keeps going. Behold the Lamb of God. And they kind of just start following after Jesus. They start just chasing after him. And it's like this moment where you got to ask yourself, like, what, where, where are they? It's like maybe have you ever been in a store and somebody's following some footsteps behind you? And you're like, man, are they following me? Like, well, why, are they, why are they so close to me? Well, this is what Jesus begins to see. And, and we believe these are probably like two teenage boys. So, so we, I would say they're kind of awkwardly following behind Jesus. And Jesus turns to them and he asks them this question. What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the mighty move of your Holy Spirit that's in this place. What you're doing in this church and in hearts and lives. I pray today that there would be less of us and more of you. I pray that the word of God would just pierce our hearts. And God, help us to be a people that are chasing after the things that you want us to go after in life. We pray these things in your holy and precious name today. Amen and amen. So as we launch the series today, I just really want to focus on the dialogue that we see in John chapter 1 that these disciples have with Jesus. Because the whole premise of this series is really like how do we stay close enough to Jesus to, to transform our lives into the way that he's called us to live. There's a saying that I've heard other ministers use at times and, and other people talk about that we need to stay close enough to Jesus that we are covered in the dust of our rabbi. That we're walking so close to him that, that the dirt from his feet gets on us because we're pursuing everything that he has for our life. That where God goes, where Jesus goes, we should go. Where Jesus leads, that's where we should be found. And that's exactly what happens in this passage of scripture found in John chapter 1. And in this passage of scripture, there, there, are, there are these three distinct lines of dialogue. And so I want to give them to you, and then I want to take them line by line, question by question, and, and begin to ask God, what is it that he's saying to us today? There's, this, there's these three lines of dialogue. It's Jesus' question to them, where he says, what are you seeking? There's the response of Andrew and John that says, God, where are you staying? And then there's an invitation that Jesus gives, and I really believe it's an invitation for each and every one of us here today, where Jesus says, come and you will see. And I think this conversation is a pattern for how we all come to Jesus and we follow him. Now at first glance, when you read this passage of scripture, or at least when I read this in John chapter 1, it almost kind of seems like a pointless passage of scripture. But may I remind you today that the biblical writers never put anything in scripture by accident. Like it may at first glance seem like a meaningless encounter that nothing really happens in this conversation that's taking place. That, that Jesus says, what are you seeking? They say, where are you staying? And he just simply says, come and you will see. But there are no meaningless encounters with Jesus. There's no meaningless dialogue with Jesus. And this seemingly innocent question is not so innocent. So let's look at it comment by comment this morning. Because as these two disciples leave John and they begin to follow Jesus, the very first thing is the question that Jesus asked them. And Jesus' question was this. What are you seeking? What are you seeking? And this is a really profound question. And I would even say that today as we've gathered in this place that we are a little bit like the disciples. You got out of bed this morning. You showed up at church today hoping, desiring to encounter Jesus. You may even say that you followed him to this place. And I think if Jesus was on the stage today, he might would ask you the very same question about your life. What are you seeking? What 
are you after? Why did you come here? What are you searching for in life? And the truth is, is that's not a simple question at all. In fact, it may be the most profound question that a human being could ask themselves. What am I seeking? What am I looking for in life? And what you will find is simply this, is that your desires drive your decisions. You do the things that you do in life because they are driven by the desires that are deep inside of your heart and your soul. And so answering this question, what are you seeking, is a paramount question to answer in life. But the problem is is that it's nearly impossible to answer this question truthfully. And the reason is this, is that if we're being honest with ourselves today, is that our desires are not always clear. That our desires in life are often tricky and they, they can even be a little bit slippery to obtain. And so I don't know if you've noticed, but that your desires in life are not even clear and obvious to you. Like, have you ever had a moment in life where you said something, and in the very moment that you said those words, you wished that you could take those words back? I know I've been there. And we say these words, and we think to ourselves, why did I say those things? We'll even say things like, where did that come from? And the truth is this, is that there is some deep desire on the inside of you and those words came out of your mouth because of a desire that is hidden on the inside of us. Because sometimes we hide our desires. And the reason we hide our desires is because they may be too painful to actually acknowledge in life because we're ashamed of some of the desires and the thoughts that we have even for our own life. That oftentimes our desires are not always clear. But I've also discovered that oftentimes our desires are fickle. They're always changing. I mean, think about your life for a moment. Like for some of you, what you wanted yesterday is not actually the same thing that you want today for your life. If you have some years on you, you could probably think to yourself for a moment and you can look back over your life and you might say things like this, what I wanted in my 20s is different than what I desire today. I mean, have you ever looked at old pictures? Maybe they're on your phone or in a photo album. And I don't know about you, but I can look at old pictures about my life and I see some of the clothes that I wore and I'm like, what was I thinking, right? Like what, why did I even wear that? What, what, what would happen? My, my desires change like, like because our desires in life are always changing. And that's what makes this question so difficult. Like, what are you seeking? Well, if we're being honest, it may depend on what day you ask me. Because our desires shift and change. But not only are our desires changing, our desires are are even confusing. Like oftentimes our desires are often in conflict with one another. Like we have competing desires in our life. Like I have a desire to get in shape. But I have a competing desire to eat that hamburger that looks just so good, right? And to eat more ice cream and to have more sweets. What, what's happening in that moment? I have two competing desires. I have a desire to get up early and to read scripture and spend time with God. But I also have a desire to stay up late and to binge watch whatever show that you like to watch and you can fill in the blank. You see, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not qualified to answer Jesus' question. What are you seeking? Because if you really understood who you are, and if you really understood the very nature of your heart, we too might be hesitant to answer this question. Because if we're honest with ourselves, the truth is, is we don't know what's best for our lives. 
We don't know what's best for ourselves. And it's because of this that I love the response of the disciples. Because at first glance, the response of the disciples seems ridiculous, doesn't it? It's like Jesus asked them, what are you seeking, Angie? What are you seeking, John? And he is the son of God. It's like the moment where they could have asked anything of Jesus. Because he's asking them, what is the desire of your heart? What is it that you're going after? And when they could have asked Jesus whatever they wanted, they simply say this response, where are you staying? And it seems a little ridiculous, but I would argue with you today that it's the very best response that they could give. Because they understood what we often fail to understand about ourselves. They understood that they were not qualified to determine where they were going or what was best for their life. And some of you today, as you walk into this room, you may find yourself in a situation where you would say, yep, that's the story of my life. Like, I thought I knew what was best for my life. I thought I knew how to guide my life and the direction my life should go in. But I made a decision, I made a choice, and it messed up my life because I did not know what was best for my life. And there's a powerful moment in our life where hopefully we can realize that we make a lousy king of our lives. We make lousy kings of our life. And the best thing that we can do is not come to God when he says, hey, what, what do you want? What, what, what is your desire? What are you seeking? That the best thing that we can do in those moments is to simply ask Jesus, where are you staying? Where are you going to be? Where are you leading me? Because wherever it is that you are, that is where I want to go. And I would say to you today, That this is the best posture for anyone who seeks to follow Jesus. That when we find ourselves at the crossroads of life. When you find yourself having to try try to decide what to do in a moment. Instead of trying to chart our own course. Instead of trying to figure it all out. That we simply begin to ask the question. Hey God, where is it that you are moving? Where is it that you are going to be? God, where is it that you are leading? Because it's in that moment that we should begin to say to ourselves, I'm not trying to chart the course of my own life because God, wherever it is that you are, that is where I want to be. I came across a prayer by an individual by the name of Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk and and I came across this prayer and I wanna share it with you this morning. How many know that sometimes we, we can find prayers that maybe we should be praying over our life or maybe even prayers that other people have prayed and there's nothing wrong with taking those prayers and praying them over your own life. And this is a prayer that he prayed over his life. He says, my Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. How many feel that way? I do not see the road ahead of me and I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road. And though I may know nothing about it, Therefore, I will trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear. For you are ever with me. And you will never leave me to face my perils alone. And I can't think of a better posture. And a better response for a Christ follower to have than to say, God, I just simply want to go wherever it is that you are going. Because that's what it means to be a disciple. And that's an invitation that Jesus gives to us. It's the invitation when Jesus simply says, follow me. And so I love the third piece of this dialogue that we see in John chapter 1. 
Because as the disciples ask Jesus, where are you saying? Look at the invitation that Jesus gives to them. He says, come and you will see. And I believe this is more than just a simple response to these two individuals that day. But I believe that this is the response that Jesus has for each and every one of us as we pursue a life with Christ. That Jesus invites all of us in this room today into a journey of faith where we have the ability to come and see, come and experience, come and see where it is that Jesus is leading us. And it leads us to this very important principle in life. And it's this, that action precedes understanding. Action precedes understanding. That Jesus looks at these disciples, he looks at these followers, and he simply says, come and you will see. Come, do something, and then eventually you will understand exactly what it is that I'm leading you into. Like, notice what Jesus doesn't do. When they ask, hey, Jesus, where are you staying? Jesus doesn't begin to tell them, well, guys, here's the course and the direction of my life. He doesn't give them the roadmap to the next three years of ministry where he would say to them, well, hey, guys, if you come and you stay with me, if you come and you go where I'm leading, then eventually this is going to lead to Jerusalem and eventually I'm going to die on the cross and and eventually I'm going to ask you to give your very life for this cause. Jesus doesn't lay any of that out. Instead, he invites them to a life where they act now and understand later. Act now and understand later. And this is the life of following after God. The life that God has called us into is a life of action. In the Bible, it's called, it's called by faith living. And it's what we see in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the faith chapter. It's the, it's the book of faith. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Like, what does that mean? Like, what is hope? Hope is a longing. Hope is a desire for a better tomorrow. It's hope that has the ability to draw us forward. You could think of hope in this way, that hope is like gas in the tank that that keeps the car moving ahead, believing that tomorrow can be better than today. And the truth is this, is we all need hope. Because if you lose your hope, you're going to lose your ability and desire to move forward in life. But faith is different than hope. Faith is the action that happens now based on the hope that I see in the future. That's what faith is. It's the action that happens now based on what I hope I see in the future. It's based on the hope that I have in the future. And so Hebrews 11, over and over and over again, has this faith that says, by faith. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, and I would encourage you to do so this week, you will see the words by faith 24 times. And what you will discover is that every time the words by faith is spoken, it's linked to someone who's acting and doing something now based on the hope that they have for the future. And so Hebrews 11 would say things like this, by faith, Moses goes to Pharaoh. By faith, Moses steps in front of Pharaoh with just a staff in his hand and an inability to speak. And he will look at Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, let my people go. Because by faith, he believed the words of God that God said that, guess what? There is a future hope for the children of Israel and there's a land that I have promised them. And so Moses, it took faith and confidence that God would deliver on the vision that God had given him for the future. By faith, Noah built an ark when there had never been a drop of rain on the, in the world. And because of that faith, his family was saved and God restored mankind through Noah. By faith, Abraham was called by God to go to a land that he had not seen 
And he went. It was what? Action in the present moment. Based on hope for the future, the hope that God had given him, that he said, I will give you this land and I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. It's trusting that by obeying and following that God will take care of me. And can I just remind you that every single one of us in this room who said yes to Jesus is called to live that type of life. It's called to live a by faith life. That we are called to act now and understand later. And this goes against everything that we've ever learned in life, doesn't it? Like we want to understand and then we will act. But that's not what faith looks like. Like we have a hope for our future. And God says, I want you to move now. Because your action is going to precede your understanding. Standing. I think one of the best examples of this is from a movie, a cinematic classic known as The Karate Kid. Anybody remember The Karate Kid? Not the new stuff, right? Old school, OG as my son would call it. The OG, and, and if you remember The Karate Kid, you had Daniel and Mr. Miyagi. And Daniel, as the, as the movie started, he's getting beat up by some bullies at school. And so he turns to Mr. Miyagi and he says, Mr. Miyagi, I want you to train me. I I want you to to make me a karate master. Do you remember what Mr. Miyagi does? He gives Daniel a series of what seems to be meaningless tasks. Remember this? Wax on, wax off. Paint the fence. Sand the floor. And and Daniel shows up every day and he's doing this what? Over and over and over again. And Daniel sees these as some meaningless exercise. And he simply begins to think that Mr. Miyagi is just taking advantage of him. And Daniel is ready to quit. And it's in the moment that Daniel was ready to quit that like Mr. Miyagi like comes at Daniel and then all of a sudden he's like wax on, wax off, paint the fence, sand the floor. And he's all of a sudden has these incredible karate skills. And that is really a perfect picture of what Jesus calls us to do. Action precedes understanding. Come and you will see. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. You just simply follow him and he will lead you to places where it may not make sense in your life. It'll lead you to places maybe at times where you'll go, man, I don't even know why I signed up to serve on that Saturday down at Victory Center. I don't know why I keep showing up to be a mentor on Thursday nights to kids who need mentors in their life. I, I, don't, I don't know why I continue to, to read the word of God because it doesn't even seem to make sense to me. I don't know why I continue to show up to, to quiet times with God and, and I don't like silence in my life and I feel like I'm sitting here in the silence and I don't even know what to say. But the truth is this, is when you go through the process, the very act of doing is training you in ways that you don't realize. And the action that you put is preceding your understanding because Jesus has simply invited us to come and you will see. Say yes and obey first and you will understand and come to see later. And there's times and there will come a time where you will say just as Daniel did, I didn't see it in the beginning. But I'm so glad that I said yes. And this is the best posture for any Christ follower. Is that we get to the place in our life where we simply say, God, wherever you lead, that is where I'm going. And so as we walk through this series, this is kind of the big thought that we're going to walk out over the next several weeks That if you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. If you want the life of Christ, you're going to have to live the lifestyle of Christ. What is the life of Jesus? It's the fruit of the Spirit. 
It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness. It's goodness. It's gentleness. It's faithfulness. It's self-control. And if you want those things operating in your life, you have to begin to adopt the kind of life that Jesus lived. And you can't separate the life of God from the ways of God. You can't expect to get the results of the fruit of the Spirit in your life unless you, are, unless you begin to live a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led life every single day. And so we have to understand that the patterns of our life have to begin to change. And we may not even understand it at the beginning, but we're just going to simply say, my actions are going to precede my understanding because I'm going to begin to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus because I truly want the life of Christ. And you may have walked into this room today and you may have a deep desire to please God, but your pattern of life does not allow you to do so. The pattern of life that you've engaged in isn't allowing you to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Like you're like, you're like, well, Aaron, I don't love to read scripture. I don't love spending time in prayer. Aaron, I don't love coming on Sundays and worshiping God and lifting my hands. And I would just say to you, the reason you don't love those things is because you don't read scripture. You don't spend time in prayer. Because you don't worship. And you say, well, Aaron, that sounds redundant. No, no, that's the truth of the matter. My actions are going to precede my understanding. And so I'm just going to start doing these things because I know that it's going to lead to something even though I don't understand it yet. And so by faith, I'm going to begin to do those things. I think the struggle that we have in the body of Christ is we are like, well, Aaron, I need to feel it in order to engage it. I need to feel something in order to do something. And I see it all the time in church. Some of you are like, well, Aaron, it's disingenuous if I choose action before feeling. Like if I'm just doing it and I'm just going through that thing. Like, no, I got to feel something on the inside of me. I would argue, no. Choosing is part of the process. Can I tell you something? There are plenty of times that I've had to in my life Choose an action before I feel it. Like there's times that I've walked into this building on a Sunday morning. And I've walked up to a front seat. And can I be honest with you? Maybe it's what's happened that week. Maybe with my morning that I've gone. I don't feel like worshiping. But you know what I choose to do? Worship. I choose to lift my hands. I choose to say, God, I'm going to give you everything in this moment. And I just, here's what I see time and time again. Even in moments when I'm like, I don't want to worship. I don't feel like worshiping. I begin to lift my hands. I begin to open my mouth. I begin to worship God. And there's just something that takes place. And all of a sudden, the feeling shows up because I've engaged in worship. And I think so often in the body of Christ, we're like, well, Aaron, I don't feel it. So I'm just not going to do it yet. No, no, no. You choose it before you even feel it because it's by faith I'm doing it by faith I'm worshiping by faith I'm reading scripture by faith I'm doing the things that God has asked me to do because choosing is part of the process and so we choose things I guarantee you but here's where I'm gonna push I guarantee you there's Sunday mornings where you've had a long weekend and you're like I don't feel like coming to church I get it But you know what you got to do? I'm choosing to go anyways. I'm choosing to show up because when you show up, there's something that begins to happen on the inside of you. When you show up, you begin to have encounters with other people and encounters with God that begins to change things in your life. And this is what Jesus invites us into. Come and you will see. Obey now and see later. So don't be led by your feelings. Instead, create a set pattern of life that will lead you to become more like Jesus. And so, if you want to live the life of Jesus, then you have to take on his manner and his way of life. And as they get ready to come and as they get ready to close, real quickly, I want to give you, and we're going to dive into these over the next several weeks. I want to give you four real quick practical thoughts. Four real quick challenges of how did Jesus pattern his life and what does it look like for me to pattern my life after the life of Jesus 
Because if you want to experience the life of Christ, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And so what do we see in the life of Christ? The first was this, is he engaged scripture. He engaged scripture. What we see in the life of Christ is he quoted it all the time. They tell us that 10% of the words in the New Testament, the words of Christ were taken from Jesus quoting Old Testament scripture. And some of you are like, well, Aaron, I don't like reading scripture. And so if you want to start liking, if you want to start liking to read scripture, then you need to read scripture. Begin with action, understand later. I would even say this to you. Wake up every day and begin to tell yourself, I love scripture, even if you don't love scripture. Begin to say it over and over and over again. Be consistent with it. And even though you don't feel it or understand it, keep reading and fall in love with scripture. This is what Jesus did. He quoted scripture. He engaged scripture. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus goes out into the wilderness. And you know what happens? The enemy shows up to tempt him. And you know what Jesus did every time he faced the temptation from the enemy? He quoted scripture to him. Every time the enemy asked him to do something, he would say, I can't do that because it goes against the word of God. And some of you struggle so often with temptation in your life. It's because you're lacking an understanding of scripture in your life. Jesus would say these things. Like man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from what? The mouth of God. Like it's the the thing that sustains me. It's the thing that supports me. And so if we're going to live the lifestyle of Jesus, we got to engage scripture. What else did Jesus do? Jesus lived a life that was full of prayer and solitude. Jesus would get away to quiet places and he would get by himself so that he could hear the voice of God. You need times in your life where there is silence and there is solitude in the presence of God. And if you always have a screen on, if you always have music blaring, if you always have that TV on, can I tell you something? You're not allowing God an opportunity to speak to you. And so we have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. The third thing that we see from Christ is this. It was a life of service. Jesus lived a life of service. You need to be serving somewhere. You need to have the intentional practice in your life of showing up for no other reason but to serve. Not to make your name known. Not so that people can pat you on the back. But I'm just showing up to serve because this was the life that Jesus modeled for us. He would say, Scripture would tell us that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so there's areas of service that we challenge you to all the time that you need to begin to show up and just simply say, yes, there's gifts, talents, and abilities that God has placed in your life. You are gifted. But you've got to say yes to service, and you've got to say yes to the things that God has placed in your life. And the reason he's put them there is for the benefit of others. And the amazing thing is this, is that when you give of yourself, God miraculously does things back in our life. Like it's the principle of give and it will be given unto you. Give of yourself and you'll see it returned into your life. And so you need to deny yourself and serve other people because this is the life that Jesus lived. And the final thing is this, is that Jesus was a part of the church. He was engaged in the church. In Matthew 16, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus was passionate about the church. And when scripture speaks about the church, over and over again, the the reference to the church is that the church is the bride of Christ. And it's the body of Christ. And there's just this thought out here in the world today that so many Christians have adopted in their life that they think that they can have a relationship with God just without a relationship with the church. And that because of maybe corruption or duplicity or hypocrisy that they've experienced in the church or hurt that they've experienced in the church, they've all of a sudden divorced themselves from the body of Christ. But I need to remind you that everything that Jesus did in his life was in the confines of relationship. And it was a relationship that he had with his disciples and then 
His disciples would go out and they would have a relationship with other believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And they would say that they would gather together and they would break bread and they would do life together. And how many know there was still hypocrisy even in those moments? I mean, Judas walked with Jesus for three years and then he sold him out at the end. Talk about hypocrisy. Like he was close to Jesus and he's like, I'm going to sell you out. But that didn't stop people from coming and seeing. And so you need to understand that the church is not an additional add-on to your life. That it's a part of the process that God has for each and every one of them. Jesus embraced the church and so do you. Also, should you embrace the body of Christ? And so they come to Jesus and they said, Jesus, where are you Stay. And Jesus simply says, come and see. And if we're going to come and see, can I tell you where you're going to see it? You're going to meet him in scripture. You're going to meet him in prayer. You're going to meet him in serving. You're going to meet him in the church. Because the invitation that God gives each and every one of us is to come and see. The invitation is to follow me. Follow the footprints that I'm leaving see the life that I'm living and come and see. And so by faith, we go and we see. So if you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And action precedes understanding. So what action is God asking you to take today? What type of by faith living is God calling you into today? What is it that you've been reluctant to engage into? Because maybe you don't understand it, but by faith, God's saying, I want you to take that step because that action is going to precede understanding. And he's inviting you to come and see. Did you stand to your feet with me this morning? just bow your heads for a moment we're not going to close in a song today as we normally do but I just want to simply ask you the question what is he asking of you what is the Holy Spirit asking of your life today and for every single one of us that's in this room it may look different what is God asking you to follow him into how is he asking you to come and see and experience. Maybe for some of you in this room, you're like, Aaron, I've never actually answered the call to come and follow Jesus. I've never just said, God, I'm wherever you go, that's where I'm going. Maybe for some of you in this room, you've just lived through your own desires, your own wants. And maybe today you just simply need to say, Jesus, I'm coming, I'm following, I'm going after you. I'm going to come and see. And I would even say to you today that just as Andrew and John left and became disciples of Jesus, you don't have to have it all figured out. Action precedes understanding. And it's simply by faith that we say, hey, Jesus, I'm coming in your direction. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you would say to me, Aaron, I've not said yes to following Jesus, but I want to do so today. I want to surrender to him. I want to come and see. If you're here today, I'm not going to embarrass you. We're going to just pray right at your seat today. But I would love for you to just acknowledge that that's where you're at in this journey. And by faith, God, I'm going to live for the hope of what you've promised me tomorrow. If you're here today and you say, Aaron, I need to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior, would you just slip your hand up in this place today? Would you just acknowledge that in this room, that yes, I need to follow after Jesus? Amen. Amen. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just pray this prayer with me today? Whether you raised your hand, whether you've ever said this prayer before, would, just, would we all make a commitment once again to follow after him? Would you say, dear Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you forgive me of my sins? 
I make you the Lord of my life. And I'm choosing to follow after you. Help me to live by faith and not by sight. I give you my life today. In in your name we pray. Amen. Would you give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise today, church? Come on.